Yeah. Okay, mate. So, Sean. Yep. Tell you what, first and foremost, um, you know, give the guys a wee bit of background on yourself. Because, you know, I get asked this question a lot of the time. How did Elite end up in Belfast, blah, 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 and all this here carry on? And I just kind of direct them your way and just say, go and see this crazy bastard. He'll tell you. So why don't you give them a bit of background on that? But also some of the stuff that you kind of faced in 2008, which um, I suppose, all right, you know, the gym's not closed or anything they got there, but there are a lot of similarities. Mega Lens, can you... Let me just manage everyone here. Make sure everyone else is muted. Yeah, that's us now, dude. Go ahead. Yep. So the first question I liked uh, the most there, because you asked quite a few, that was like a double barrel question there. <laughs> the first one you said, how did the lead end up in Belfast? Because you have balls like a fucking Bengali tiger. That is I how... do, dude, I do. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is how I lead in Belfast. But um, how did I start? Well, look, you know, I grew up a very, from a very different kind of, I suppose, conditioning than most. My family were quite entrepreneurial. My, my dad actually was the guy who sold Honda, the first Honda on this island. Mm -hmm. um, and from the age I get hold of hose, no shit, I was in there every kind of school holiday, weekends, Easter, summer. Like, I was in there working. Well, I was probably playing with a fucking hose, you know, when I was at the age of nine. Usual but, like, story, usual story. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like uh, from the age of nine, like I was on the books in the fucking business, and I went through like car valeting. That's where I started in, and was actually one of my most favorite areas of the business. Went from car valeting all the way through to finally at the age of seventeen, I ended up in car sales all by a complete accident. Right. Genuinely, because um, there was a salesman that was fired, and my dad was basically my dad was a mad bastard. He was crazy to me, right? He actually fired me four times in my what, entire career, what, right? Was he worse than Phil Dog? Was he worse than Phil Dog? That's no, Phil Dog's on a level of his own. This, Phil, this, this, is, this is Sean's brother, by the way. Craziest motherfucker I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Didn't I tell you he was? Oh, no, he's on a level of unique, that uh, guy. So uh, at the age of 17, he ended up um, in car sales, and it was something that I didn't realize that I had, I suppose, an active for flair for. And then my brothers were my first mentors. Um, they were a lot older than me. I was the youngest in the family, you know, and they had achieved a lot of stuff by the time I came onto the scene. And they just basically taught me and gave me a financial education. I mean, at the age of 17, the first book I was given was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Amazing book, by the way. And it changed my fucking life. Like, at the end of that summer, like, I, I started car sales in May. At the end of the summer, September, when I was going back to university, I had applied for a mortgage and put down a deposit on my first house because the opportunity in the marketplace and the skills and the techniques and stuff that I was taught were incredible and allowed me to capitalize on a unique or the perfect storm, if you want to call it. So it rolled on, you know, went to university, continued selling cars all the way through university, came back and started selling houses and shit like that and cars, moving up the property ladder and it got to the point where I started to see things that would improve profitability to get people to sell more stuff because look, in cars, you don't actually make money selling cars. You sell a new Honda at a loss. This is something that a lot of people don't believe. They think that okay. like, they think there's, there's like three grand, uh, you know, profit on a car. There's not. You actually, we were selling cars at a loss where you make money on, on cars is the gap the finance, the VRI, the super guard, the alloys, the spoiler, the, all of the add-ons. Yep, so yes. what, we, what we had to do was adapt the sales process to the marketing, the changes in the marketplace. So cars at a, at a point in time actually appreciated in value. But when I get on the scene, they were depreciating in value and dealers had to hit higher and higher targets to get their back end bonuses, which meant that the landscape in the whole fucking car industry was changing. And the people who could adapt the quickest were the ones that were surviving. And we adapted quickly because we saw the chassis profit, actually the profit in selling the car was dead. And if we didn't quickly adapt to the change in marketing conditions, we were going to be fucking wiped out. So what we did was we adapted the marketing and the sales process and the training of the staff in line with the changes in marketing conditions so we could capitalize on the area of upselling. Okay. and finance sales and VRI and that transformed our business over the period of nine years of me ma managing a sales team the teams that I managed sold uh, a quarter billion in cars so we used to do 25 million a year at our peak uh, over a nine-year period we were uh, uh, we were um, um, involved in selling 250 million 
total. Um, and the biggest sale in my life, I sold the company along with my, my father and my two brothers for 4.5 million. It's the Kentucky Fried Chicken fucking yeah. base on the Boucher Road now. We yeah. sold it to Michael Herbert, um, which is crazy. It just shows you there's more money in chicken wings than there is in fucking Honda's, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we oh, sold it for four point five million to Michael Herbert in two thousand six, and with that money, we took our share fifty percent. Fifty percent went to my dad. He retired. He was out for health reasons, and me and my brothers went all in on a massive property deal. We were going to create and build out ninety eight houses for the Department of Social Development, and we went all in. So we we doubled. We fucking went all in thinking we were going to capitalize on this property market that was, you know, rising beyond all predictions and expectations. But unfortunately, something came that the whole world couldn't have predicted at that time, which was the global financial crisis. And yeah, instead of making another, we were going to sell them all, 98 houses for the Department of Social Development who were actually going to buy the deal, i.e. the government was going to write the check for this fucking thing and use it for socially affordable housing. So the, the government don't normally renege in their deals, but they did in this instance because... Fanny Man Freddie Mac went down. Then uh, that was the first global financial institution to fall. Not many people know that. They know they, they they've heard of the Lehman Brothers, but they never heard of Fanny Man Freddie Mac. Right. Fanny Man Freddie Mac were the first people to go down, and they were the underwriters for Lehman Brothers. And when that fell, then what we seen was the subprime mortgage lending business just unraveled. And uh, the best description I've heard of it was like. The way they were selling mortgages and packaging them up, it was like having, you know, sushi go around a sushi train and it looks beautiful from the outside. It's like, ooh, because they were putting all this AAA rated mortgage debt. But at the core of it, there was this rotten fish. There was like 40% of the people weren't fucking paying the mortgages. But the way they wrapped this looked like a really appetizing dish. And they opened these to the markets and fucking everybody been eating in this sushi. And now they're all going to be sick. <laughs> That's pretty much what happened. I mean, that's the best analogy I can put on the hardcore financial stuff that was happening. But yeah, so then what happened was we ended up owing the bank 1.5 million. I went completely broke, um, lost my house, my car, the fucking shirt off my back. I actually had to go um, and sign on. So uh, yeah, this is, this is my second exposure to something that's globally changing, you know? So what, what are the... What was going through your head at the time, Sean? I mean, obviously, I don't know. What, what, did you have any kids or anything at the time? Um, yeah. So you, you did have kids. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't know about you, dude, right? I mean, obviously, that was set in stone. Do you know what I mean? At that time, it was set in stone. You guys were going to lose 1.5 million, whatever. You were forced to go. It was basically taken out of your hands. Now, yeah. compare that to, I suppose, what's happening today. No one really knows. No one really knows the, the, the outcome that's going to come of this. Like, let's face it. No one. No one knows what's going to happen next. But let, let me ask you a question. Do you feel more in control of what is happening today than what you did then? Well, I'm actually taking exactly the same position as it did back then. I'm not crying over the shit that happened. You know, because okay. there there are only two reactions to something like this. And there are only three possible scenarios. So let's talk about that. So okay. reaction one is where you bitch and you moan. Ah, fuck, it's not fair. I mean, get over it. Grow the fuck up. Yeah, the world's not fair. Yeah. You know, I cannot control anything that's going on right now. Back then, I had absolutely no control over what was going on. So don't focus on the shit that's not in your control. Focus on the stuff that is in your, in your control. And ask yourself the most empowering question. Now what the fuck are you going to do? because <laughs> look now this puts it back in your it's like well what I can control is my reaction I can't control economic factors the external environment even other people's opinions or what they think what I can control is my action and the way that I react to this environment and this scenario now love it love it dude so, that's the only two things that you can actually concentrate on my choice is to choose the shit in my control and control that to the best of my ability now in terms of like what's going to happen there's only three possible scenarios right now so scenario one, this virus goes as quickly as it can. And in maybe one or two or three weeks, we go back to some form of normality, whatever that looks like, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Two, this goes on for, you know, eight, 12 weeks, long into the summer, maybe Leo Vradkar says, and, you know, it'll be a different thing on the other side of this. Or three, you know, this thing could be fucking one or two years and it's catastrophic. And 
the world on the other side of this is a completely different place than we've ever seen or know before. And really, in either way, again, it's like, can I control any of that? No, but I'm prepared for number three. Okay. I'm prepared for the worst, and I'm hoping for the best. And I sincerely hope you guys would do the same. So I am, in, I am ready to fucking weather a storm of 18 months. I'm ready for that shit. Love it. Absolutely. Is it over any sooner? Fucking fantastic. But I am, I am ready for that shit. So what we've got to look at then is like our ability to predict and uh, adapt and adjust to the change in market conditions. Because, you know, the, the, look, winter is here now. No, remember that fucking... Yeah, yeah, Tony Robbins. Oh, Winter, winter's coming. No, winter's fucking here. Yep. Winter is here. It came a lot faster than any of us wanted. We didn't have time to prepare. But what we need to do is now react and try and perceive and predict the market conditions and the forces that are going to happen. And know that if we're to try and capitalize or even survive, we're going to have to pivot, leverage all the fucking resources we have in our, men in our mental capacity, our emotional intelligence, our social intelligence, and get, move into that bit where we can actually access all the resources and our thinking capacity to solve the problems that exist in this new marketplace that's coming ahead. Yeah. Versus yeah. people that are, like you discussed this in your thing, in your emails, you talk about there's only a couple of reactions. There's fight, flight, or freeze. Yep, yep. That's where a lot of people are today, aren't they? The, what, what, Sean, what, I was going to ask you this question. So, you know, in, in regards to the R industry, what, what do you think the, the outstanding sort of, outlook is on this here because if you know we had we had a conversation about this last week and i was actually really reflecting on it today isn't it funny how when everything else is all said and done we go straight back to our primal instincts which is survival and reproduction right that, that is our primal instincts and right now everyone's in survival mode and it's actually gotten to the point now where they're actually trying to fucking claw some away from other people like yep. in regards to our industry what do people need to be doing right now? And we, we, we kind of had this conversation. What do people need to be doing right now in terms of coming out of this well on the other end? Let's say in terms of marketing, first of all. Like, what, what should people be doing? Okay. Well, look, this is the thing. There's a lot of knee-jerk reactions going on, and that's what, that's what we saw, wasn't it? Yep. So you've really you've got two camps going on right now. You get the people who, who are in survival mode, right? And these people over here that are trying their fucking bet, they're fighters, they're trying to they're trying to survive. You've got the flight the freeze of the flight, and you've got the fight people here, right? Ah So look, I, I seen this post on Facebook and it made me fucking laugh because like I get it just it identified exactly who the guy was, and I was like, Oh holy shit. So he was like how, how the hell are we supposed to make income when you've got these guys and they're giving away two weeks of free workouts? Yeah. Now what the fuck are we going to do? It's like, holy shit. I was like, motherfucker, if that is your business model, like you think that information is a commodity? I mean, it's 20 fucking 20. What, what, is your Google broken? It's all there. It's all there, dude. I mean, yeah. is, <laughs> is your Google broken? Is this Google broke? Like, yeah. Broken? <laughs> I mean... This is this is a business model that should never have existed in the first place. It's antiquated. Information is not a commodity. Everything is there at your fingertips, but you've still got these people who believe that their role as a trainer is to give people exercises on a page and like the cleanest diet known to man. Mm. Now, if that worked, you and I wouldn't be in this call because we'd all be out of fucking business and everybody would be walking out there ripped to the deck with cock skin all over the body. They would be just, you know, because... The best program on earth is already out there on the internet. Some people like that. Some people didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I pre-warned them. I pre-warned them. That's good. So, um, like, that doesn't work. I mean, so they were like, don't give anything away, especially our information. Jesus, that's not where your value is. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the other camp, right, which is like, give everything away. Now, those two things are, 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 are both broken. So the, the thing is, what we've got to understand is information is not a commodity. And over here, it's like giving everything away for free isn't correct either. You, you're just being a giveaway artist. Yep. Because, yep. look, these people over here who are like, give everything away for free. This is in the back of their minds are saying, if I give all this information, all my best stuff, if I give it away for free, people will have in the back of their minds to be saying, well, if that's what he gives for free, well, imagine what he gives if I pay him. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, that's, that's incorrect as well because, you see, what you're going to do is... Well, the accountability, for one, I suppose. Accountability. That's what, 
That's yeah. where the value is. And they, they're missing that link. They don't see that, you know. So the thing is, if you're going to give everything away for free, what you're going to attract is freebie seeking people. Look, the guy, that is just the internet. We have yeah. all seen the dude who, if you give out a free lead, he downloads it. And they're just accumulating tons of this information that they do nothing with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll give you an example that everyone will, can relate to. I bet you as soon as you got into the personal trainer profession, you were at a family gathering and your fat auntie comes over and goes, oh, oh John, you're, you're a personal trainer, right? Listen, tell me, what should I be eating? Come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. look at me. I, I've got to sort this out. You're the one to help me. And then you go, all right, okay. And you think like, okay, well, so you start giving them advice. And then the next family gathering, you see them, at, they're fatter. They haven't implemented the advice. Yeah. No. So like, this is the thing. You, thinking that you're going to give away advice to people and give away your best stuff is just, it's in denial of something that we know about human nature, which is like people who pay, pay attention. Yeah. So even though, even though the landscape has changed massively, the psychology still hasn't changed around it. The psychology will always remain the same. Human nature did not change when we went online. Yep. Yep. For sure, dude. For <laughs> sure. I suppose, Sean, so what? I, you know, I would say some, some of the guys watching this now are probably, um, I mean, they're probably fearful of, you know, should I be selling right now? Because, you know, let's face it, our industry, we're, we're here to help people and it's what we do, right? So people are probably thinking, should I be selling my services right now? Should I be giving everything away because I want to help more people? But if we look at the actual psychology of it, are we essentially helping them if they're not going to implement some of the stuff that we're actually giving them? That hasn't changed. It still remains exactly the same. Nope. So look, giving, giving everything away from free is going to attract the freebie seekers, like I said. And as soon as you try to sell them something, they're going to fucking cry. Mm. That, that's yeah. just the thing. And yes, we, merchants and salespeople have known that this is human behavior for fucking centuries, right? So before I go into like what, to answer your question, I need to give people a wee bit of a background so that they understand what they should give for free, what they should pay for, and how to actually create a, stra a strategy around their whole business model. So this is the thing. Like I said, you have two camps. Don't give fucking everything away. You got to hear, give everything away. The answer lies in the middle. So okay. there are three levels to the most simple business model I can give you. And what we would call an elegant business model. So on the bottom level of that, you've got stuff that you would give away for free. Uh -huh. So what you want to give away for free is telling people what to do. Ex like exactly what we're doing here, John, right? Yeah. Telling people yeah. what they should do. Give that away for free all day long. Exercises. You want a nutrition guide? There you go. That's what to eat. You want to, you want to know a, a workout? There's what to do. Mm -hmm. You want me to coach you through this and hold you accountable to it so you get results. You want me to show you how to do it? Well, that's going to cost money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you give the what away, you, you charge for the high. Exactly. Okay. And there are two levels to the high because the first level of high is going to be a step closer to the coach, right? So for free, there's no proximity to a coach, right? Yeah. It means me sending you a PDF is automatic. It happens all by itself, right? right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just information. Information is not a commodity. I'll give you it away all day. You want me to walk you through exactly how to do this so that you get results like my group? That's going to cost you money. Sound fair enough? Cool. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. At the top level of this is where you're going to have the closest proximity to a coach. You're going to have a lot of investment. And I'm going to actually implement it with you. So that's done with you. So you've got, mm. here's what to do free. Here's how you want the templates, the strategies, the execution plans. You want um, guidance, coaching, accountability, support, motivation, direction. Super. Done with you. You want me to walk into your business, sit down and hold your hand through every step of the way. But, but you're going to pay handsomely for that. Mm. But it will be in line. It'll be a multiple of the result that you can get on the other end. Does that make sense? So now that we know the elegant business model, the next thing, the next question people usually have is like, well, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to give them this away for free. That's what, tell me exactly what kind of stuff goes there. So the, the best thing to think about in the what category, when you're giving people out what is look, you've went into Tesco's, haven't you? And 
there's somebody with a cheese, a cheese thing set out and they're giving away wee samples of cheese. So what you've got is you've got this wee cocktail stick and you've got a wee tiny block of cheese on there. It's like, would you like to try some cheese? Yeah, fuck it, I'll try some cheese. Right? Now that is a sample. They're not giving away the whole cheese. They're giving away a wee bit of it. Mm -hmm. So your what and the, the, the content that you're giving away for free needs to fall in line with that principle. If you give them too much, and this is why the people who give it all away for free is like, no. You, if you give them a the whole block of cheese, they wouldn't be hungry or want any more of the thing. Yeah. All, so you, uh, and this is why you're attracting freebie seekers. If you're, if you're giving everything away for free, then as soon as you try and sell them something, they're going to cry. It's like, no, fuck yeah, I've got it all for free anyway. It's not. So like, you've got to understand that it's the samples, it's the bite-sized stuff. You're just wetting their appetite with shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in in terms of Sean, so the I suppose where where people are coming from now, and believe it or not, I've actually found myself a wee bit hesitant on this here in the, in the last few days, yep. because you know, like I say, we we all want to help people. Yep. Suppose people are are kind of thinking now, right? If I give that, uh, if I give that sample, and here's how you do it, and if you want to know how to do it, I can walk you through that. I think people are maybe just stuck on the should I be calling people the action to actually take that next step. You know, should I be taking people from, okay, well, here's some stuff that I want to help you out with. Now, how do I do a call to action to say, listen, if you're interested, you can still, because there are still people working. There, there are still people working. That's the thing. That's what yeah, we all do, have to remember. You're 100% right, mate. What, what we should do is not be pushy or trying to manipulate or coerce people into selling. Like always. If, if people reach out for help, then just give them a Dude, I, like somebody rang me yesterday. Actually, they, they fucking DM'd me on one of my stories on Instagram. On, mm -hmm. what are we on? We're on Thursday. It was Tuesday. Dude, fucking tell me about Ascension. I want in. So set up a call with him. I talked to him yesterday. He's like, I'm in. Should I tell him no? No. No. Are you, there's a fucking pandemic. No, you can't fucking. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't be a fucking sales prevention officer. What the fuck? It's fucking ridiculous. Get that guy reached out to me, asked me for my help. And I am going to fulfill my obligation. So here's what I'll ask you. This, and this, this is for everybody. Do you believe in your product 100%? So the people that are on the screen here, do you believe that your knowledge, your tools, your skills, and your ability have the potential to help someone in a positive way using fitness as the tool? Regardless, yes? of, regardless of, regardless of the, the circumstances right now. Put it on. Just put that nice a second. I'm asking you a man-to-man, -man, man to woman question, right? Do you believe it will help 100%? If you help them with their fitness and their nutrition, could that impact their life in other areas of it in a positive way? Could they increase their, their self-confidence? Could they aesthetically change? Would their mental clarity, productivity, focus, would that all change? Could the way they carry themselves change? And therefore, if you've changed the dude with the information that you know and you've allowed that man to grow, could that change his relationship with his wife and his family? Right for the best. If you change a man, if you change the marriage, and if you change a marriage, if you change a family, and if you change a family, you change the communities here, are we having a much bigger impact with this information? Yeah? Well, then you have a fucking social responsibility to share what you know. Yeah. And anybody that's trying to hate on you at the minute, th th this wrecks my fucking head. I've yeah, seen so. where you've got this shaming going on. It's like, you, no. These are these fight, fright, and fl uh, freeze people that you discuss uh, an awful lot. Yeah. They've made their decision. And if you do something other than them, they don't understand that and they t attack which, that which they don't understand. Yeah, yeah, completely do. Mind your own fucking business. So, and, and this is why if you use the elegant business model that I'm discussing and you give away information for free, what's going to happen when you do this correctly is, you see, people are going to want to take a step closer to you. Mm. And you allow them, you capture their permission. So you remember I used to teach strategic seduction at Garrett J. White? Yeah. Taught me. So uh, fucking incredible. So the first one is communicate a message. That's the first thing in strategic seduction. And when somebody listens to that message and go, fuck, I like what this guy's saying. How do I get more of that? Well, dude, join me email. And when that guy comes into my email, he's saying openly, I want to hear more from you. I want to step that one bit closer to you. Give me more of that shit you were giving me over here, which is just like the Tesco thing. Hey, see that fucking sample? Give me some more. I love that shit. That wee yeah. slice of shit you give me. I fucking like it. Give me work and I get more of that right over there. Cool. I've asked, you've fulfilled on your obligation. So if he's on my email list, now we're in an intimate zone and I can have a one-to-one -one discussion with a person and we can begin to now start looking at this frustration and solving his problem. And if at some point in that conversation, he puts his hand up and says, I want to work with you. 
then that's a conversation between a couple of dudes who are not being coerced or persuaded or manipulated in any way, shape, or form, and they understand the mutual, uh, how they're going to interact together. They understand, you're my coach, and I'm, this is what I'm going to get out of this, and I value it, and I'm willing to pay for it. What the fuck is wrong with that? No, nothing whatsoever. So these other people who are shaming you, you know, listen, their opinion yeah. are none of my business. Well, yeah, we, we, we were chatting about this last week, and I suppose in, in Dublin it was a bigger thing because there was this... Uh, there was this thing, I suppose, going on um, where people, people in the industry were getting a wee bit ratty, dude. Yeah. And it's not needed. Like, I, I think I said to you the word last week was empathy. What's needed right now is empathy. And, 100%. you know, like, when it's all said and done, people after this will <clears throat> continue to work. They'll still have to put food on the table. They will still have to go on about their everyday life and um a lot of if if empathy is not given now that could cause a lot of damage later on down the line i mean you know even now with all of this shit going on if i it, it, you know it's invaluable to know what you don't know and if you are like out there and you're berating people for whatever they're doing right now just stop like yeah. literally just fucking stop because you yeah. don't know the situation that that person is in yeah. right now you don't yep. know the lengths that people will go to. And like I say, whenever times are hard, people just revert back to what they know and it's survival. And that's where people are probably at right now. Yep. Uh, do, do you know something? I think this is key for us to get out of this fucking shit storm. And it's understanding and recognizing when you're in survival. Mm, yeah. <laughs> because if you're operating at that level of survival, and, and this is why, when I'm looking at people, I'm just going, yeah, that dude is just stuck in survival mode. Jesus. But like, there are things you can do. I mean, I, I know recognizing is one thing and then using stuff that gets you out of survival mode means that you're focusing on the right stuff. So if you're in survival mode and you're focusing on all the shit and you're focusing on all these people and you're giving it, I mean, where the focus goes, energy flows. Oh, yeah, dude, love that. Rose, what, right? What, what, what are some of the things, Sean, I suppose, um, that trainers could be doing right now today because, you know, I, we, we, talk, we talk about this all the time, high income skills, all right? Now, for me, it's writing copy, uh, you know, communication and closing sales. Yes. And I, I think I read one of your emails the other day where you have actually enrolled on the an online course. I've done exactly the same thing, dude. I've, you know, I've just, I've just started this online course right now. Um, and it's how to build a side income, <laughs> right? Yeah. Which will come in pretty handy now. What are some of the things that trainers could be doing right now to build our high income skills. That brilliant fucking question, John, because look, actually I did a, a Facebook story on the exact same thing because a lot of people were asking me this very question. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to the first thing I said, you've only two choices. Look at the stuff that's in your control or focus on the stuff that's outside your control. Like those guys that are stuck in scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. So the stuff that is in our control is where are you going to invest your time? Yeah. Because a lot of people are going to come out of this thing exactly in the same position as they went into it. That is the wrong fucking move. Yeah. So what we need to do is look at, right, if we were to rate ourselves in a few key skills, like sales, what's your selling ability like? Marketing, it could be sales copy, could be, you know, advertising, you know, all the elements that are involved in business. They're going to fall into three categories, marketing, sales, fulfillment, right? So out of those three, and then dig it a bit deeper and find the weakest link and say, see that I am actually going to focus on getting better at this area. I'm going to buy two books. I'm going to do an online course. And when this is over, I'm going to be leveled up in these areas and set that plan out and do it. This is the best time to invest in your education because what the fuck else are you doing? You know, we've got it. 100%. Um, I, I'm actually sort of writing an email today. And it's weird. Like, th this is really going to sound weird to people, okay? But in a strange way, I'm kind of excited. And I know that sounds fucking absolutely nuts right now. In a strange way, I'm excited. I'm excited for one to see people's reactions. I mean, you know, it, everything that we take as reality in everyday life, fucking sport, entertainment, travel, like all of these things are now unnecessary. We look at these things that this, this is what helps us function in everyday life. And right now they have become unnecessary. And one thing that I always say to people, you know, there's a couple of things that are timeless and they are recession proof um yep. fitness okay H have you ever seen as many people move in all your life <laughs> never never nutrition all right 
Those things are absolutely fucking recession proof and relationships. Okay. Fitness, nutrition, and relationships. Have you ever seen so many people connect in the last 10 years? Have you ever seen so many people move? Have you ever seen so many people fight over fucking tin of beans in Sainsbury's? Like it is ridiculous. <laughs> Those things are fucking timeless. Do you know what I'm saying? And for me, it's fascinating the watch in a way. And it's kind of exciting because for me, it actually fills me with some hope that coming at the other end of this here, people will realize that those things are actually timeless. And especially for our industry, what are people going to do when they come to realize that, oh shit, that's the only, that's the only reality that we have. So that is the only reality that I do truly need to focus on. Love it, John. Never true word spoke. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of people as well think like they would just love to click their fingers and everything go back to normal. And mm. like you're just saying, realize that the landscape of economy, business, and the way that we fulfill the clients of the future is going to be a completely different thing altogether. And we need to learn how to perceive, predict, adapt, and adjust in order to be the kind of business that's going to sustain along into the future. Because mm, all like see those giveaway people or the dudes who are afraid to give away those people on either side, they're fucking dead. Mm. You know, in fact, the give the people who are giving everything away, that acts as reverse credibility because the relationship is so open. Think about this for a second. You you show me somebody who is like always on, available on the phone, you know, you can grab many moments of any day, you know, and I'll show you somebody who's exhausted, undervalued, and underpaid. Get it, get it. Definitely. And this is, again, going back to the elegant business model. If you understand the barriers that you need to create on your time and your energy and your focus, and like everybody wants to be someone whose knowledge and their time is valued, right? And the key is like understanding that these people who have always got the time for you, no barriers to them, they will never be respected and their time is never going to be valued versus people like Dan Kennedy. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> The guy can only be connected or contacted by fax and only two days a week. He has no mobile phone, no email, nothing. Mm. And I'll show you a god of his industry who is in demand for seminars and is probably the highest paid living marketer on the world today. Yeah. So I think like people really need to understand that you can't wing fitness anymore. The predictions that we're facing at the minute is that 60% of fitness businesses who've been operating in either one of those two camps that I've just described will no longer be, they're not going to be coming back the other end of this. Yeah. It's time to turn pro, people. Yeah, it, yeah. it really is time to turn pro. I'm so glad you brought up uh, Dan Kennedy or Sean, because one thing I always remember him saying was, and especially I think it's really fucking, really valuable in today's climate, because, uh, you know, trainers won't make a call to action today through fear of looking greedy, Right. The, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to look greedy if I, if I ask someone for money, right? Now, one thing that Dan Kennedy always said is greed is asking for something for nothing, okay? If you want something for nothing, then that's greedy. But if you're providing a valuable service to someone right now, then you have every right to ask for a call to action. Good. And do you know what else he used to say? Peers will sneer. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's that what we're saying a minute. Yeah. And that's a crack. I love that one. And, and, and so what, what do we really should be concentrating on? This is the question I kind of, well, maybe I didn't avoid it. I haven't said it, but I haven't really spelled it out. So what should trainers focus on in this climate? The relationship with your clients. Yeah, if is. you've got clients on your books at the minute, look at ways that you can adapt and adjust to continue to deliver the value. And remember, the value is not on exercises in a page and it's not on giving them a fucking nutrition guide. There's enough of that shit. Mm -hmm. but having coaching conversations realize that the difference between a trainer and a coach is that the coach is the person that realizes that it is accountability and the person who can get their behaviors in line with what they say they want is the coach who gets results and creates a long-term loyal client for life we're swimming in information we've never had more of it but we are lacking in implementation and this is why we've got to adjust and adapt the way we deliver stuff with a view to consumption. So like for the last two weeks, because we're probably two weeks ahead of you, we are paying members who were paying for access to the gym, right? Mm -hmm. And we pivoted immediately and delivered all of the coaching live from the gym and we walked them through the workouts. 
Now, the other thing that we've realized is consumption is lower than that. So we're going to do, we're going to do uh, stuff like this so they can, they can actually join in, right? And get more mm -hmm. interaction because this is super important. Relationship. And then, yes, it's the relationship. And then the last part is the coaching conversation. So we're opening up blocks in the day where they can contact Jay and actually have a conversation about the deeper things and the deeper reasons why people don't get results. It's got nothing to do with them being confused about nutrition. I fuck, people know that apple pie is not as good as eating an apple, but why do they keep going on for apple pie? It's the behavioral shit people need help with. Yeah. And we've got to understand that if we're going to survive in the marketplace of the future, we've got to adjust and adapt the things that we deliver of true value in a medium that suits it. And, and we've got to focus on getting results, accountability, coaching conversations, consumption, and the, maintaining that relationship. Mm -hmm. And you know, the last thing I'll say in this is like, if you're not concentrating on your relationship with your clients now, someone else will. Yeah. And when this thing comes the, the other end, who do you think they're gonna to go to? Oh yeah, yeah, big time, dude, big time. Sean, let, let's uh, let, let's open up. Um, let's open up a qu a couple of questions. Do any of the guys are on here? So Dave, Sean, Martin, uh, Andrew, Hugh Downey, Susan, guys, if you want to ask a question now, um, before I finish with one final question for Sean, which is basically, you know, what is what is the biggest lesson that he that he's taken now from obviously, you know, a huge fall in the two thousand eight market crash versus what's actually happening in you know today's marketplace okay so if you want to hit us up with a question in the chat then i will ask it to sean and he can go ahead and relay that ray gimli i'm going to mute you dude so yeah hit, hit us up with a question in the chat if you have any before we go off here today so sean um you know dude listen obviously we know you know you, you had that uh, huge blow before um, you know, whether or not, because listen, you know, you, you've, you've done some great things in the industry the, the last decade or so. I, I truly believe that everything happens for a reason. Um, and there's a reason why that happened to you. And, you know, obviously everything that's happening today happens for a reason as well. Um, so, like, what would you say is the biggest lesson that the guys could take away from what you experienced in 2008 versus today's climate as well? The, there's there's so many fucking things, but I, the first one that's just came to my head right now is the only limit to your earning potential in the fitness industry is your ability to solve problems that exist in the marketplace. Uh, okay. And this pandemic is presenting a very unique and new novel problem. So the people who win bigger to this are the people who find they're looking at what everyone else is looking at, but they're thinking a wee bit different and they're they're seeing something that other people aren't seeing. So again, it's the ability to perceive and predict adapt and adjust mm. and really like that is it's key to understand that like your earning potential's only limit is your ability to solve the problems that exist in the marketplace that that's like out of the the lesson of the 25 million because the way the car industry changed opened up new opportunities and it was just our foresight that allowed us to capitalize on that yeah. there is there is capitalization on this in a non-greedy non-shameful way when you look at the things that we've discussed in this entire podcast here today where you see that you have a social responsibility to share what you know so that other people can grow and that information has a value and if you actually don't charge for it people will not pay attention to it so in fact you're doing them a favor by charging and never undercharge from the professionalism that you provide yep and um, so that, i mean that that's the the first thing comes to my mind how's that fucking awesome dude awesome um martin was just on here asking now you know i suppose he, he's saying basically is it immoral to offer uh, home delivery on protein bars, shakes, and stuff through courier. Uh, I think I like I, I think I already know the answer to this here, but I'm I'm gonna hear your scope on it, Sean. Do people want it? Then I'll listen to Gary V. He says, let the market decide, because the market is the market is the market. And if somebody else wants to shame me or say like, I mean, fuck them. Dude, we, we ordered coffee today, it's gonna come to the house soon. <laughs> do, do you want coffee? I want coffee. <laughs> well, there you go. Pay for coffee. Get some coffee delivered. It's yeah. just, it's, it, you see the way the perceptions of other people are uh, impacting what we do. It's like, yeah. I mean, well, we're focusing on the wrong people. Let's not focus on the people who could run you down and the people who could object to what you're doing and focus on the people like in this group who are given support, direction, and guidance 
mm. for guys who are trying to stay alive and put food on the table for our fucking families. Like that's, I mean, anybody, anytime you start listening or giving time to somebody who's trying to pull you down like that, realize that that person's taking food out of your kid's mouth. And you're giving them the power to do so as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, you, you, like it, you're, you're only limited there by, you know, your perception of them actually having some power over you. If, if you don't have that, you know, it, it's cool. You can go on about your, your daily life and soon everything will return to normal and they will realize how much they fucked up. Yep. Look, I was only up at the, there's a corner shop up at the top of the street here. Thank fuck it's open because I've been eating out of it for the last two weeks, right? Because there's nothing <laughs> open. And, uh, I was talking to him and he was like, oh, I see. And he was talking about the shame that he saw on social media from other gyms running people down. Like, for instance, a guy cleaned his gym, sanitized it and was like, look, I've just cleaned my gym and da, da, da. And there was about 90 comments of people hating him. And then somebody actually called him. Said to him, how does it feel to be the Bin Laden of the fitness industry? That's what he fucking said. Jesus but anyway, Christ, dude. I was describing this to the guy in the shop, and he said, well, look, Sean, I did a leaflet drop around Black Rock here in the area because there's quite a lot of you know, older generation people living here. And what he was offering was like, because these people are afraid to come out of their house, he has like a, a deli delivery service that he uses for corporates. But he was like, well, look, I can actually deliver this to the people who are unable to come out of their homes. Mm-hmm. And a guy came into the shop and was fucking berating him for doing this shit. And he was like, "Crazy dude, what is your problem? Like, um, these people can't leave the house, and I'm actually delivering food to the door that they want, but they can't get, obtain. Like, what? What the fuck? What planet do you live on? Yeah, these yeah, people assholes." Sean Hugh Downey asked, um, "Do you think that online coaching? Uh, I suppose you know two two fucking two ends of the scale here. Two opposite questions from Hugh and Dave." One, Hugh Darney asked, um, and you could probably answer this here with both, do you think an online coaching will be bigger than face-to-face coaching coming out the other end of this? Dave Elwood actually asked, do you think that personal training will explode on the other end of this here? Um, so what are your thoughts on either of those questions, dude? Oh, okay. So let's take the first one there. So Hugh, thanks for your question, mate. Is online coaching going to be bigger? Well, look, there is the thing about online coaching is that the market is the whole entire world if you choose to to go for it, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, in terms of like a population and the percentages of sales, yes, of course, it could be for the individual who's offering it successfully. It can be bigger in terms of the revenue and the amount of people that you can attract. Mm-hmm. But really, I think the thing he's asking is, it, will people want more online coaching or will they want face to face? There's always going to be the customer for online and they're a different customer than the person who wants face to face because online coaching is for someone who does not really, I think they're a more mature customer. Anyway, the ones we go for are a more mature customer. They've probably been around the block. A lot of them are actually trainers themselves and they see the value and accountability. Mm -hmm. Don't need somebody to go, that's split squat shit. Here's what you need. The more that kind of a person and they they understand they value the, the accountability of it. Uh, and those, I think, are the best kind of online clients to have, right? Yeah. And on a sliding scale of proximity to a coach, that's kind of in the middle, right? It's not just sending somebody a fucking PDF of exercises again. Remember? Mm, I'm yeah, not yeah, yeah. on that. And it's not, that. right? So yeah. it's in the middle. And those people in the middle, it's the accountability, the support, the direction, the guidance. And they want to outsource and not have it take up any of their fucking time, right? So there's always going to be that guy. Um, like there's always going to be the dude who goes after the whole world market. But there's also going to be the fact that personal training is pampering. Like if we're talking one-to-one, and our gym one-to-one, when we offered it was 1,600 euros a month. Mm -hmm. And we had people pay for that because, look, the guy who wanted let me give you a for instance in terms of client. A guy had a prostate removal, right, from the hospital because he had cancer of the prostate. Mm -hmm. And he spent 12 weeks in the hospital doing physiotherapy and uh, occupational therapy and all that. And at the end of the 12 weeks, he said, right, you're ready to go home. And he was like, but hold on, I'm still pissing my pants here. And they're like, yes, but you you no longer have a disease. So the hospital and and the the medical community, their definition of health is the absence of disease. But that's not optimal, right? So he was like, well, I'm not performing optimally. He came in to me and he sat down and he told me this whole position. I said, mate, you actually need one-to-one personal training. And he was like, can, what can I expect? And I was like, well, in 12 weeks, we will have you sorted because you need to gain control of certain muscles. And you, you guys know what I'm talking about. And he was like, right, he was listening to me. And he says, well, actually, 12 weeks, I want to go and visit my daughter in South Africa. She's just had a baby daughter and I can't last the flight. Okay. 
I'm wearing like a thing now to make sure that and I have to be careful the way I get up off this seat. Otherwise, it's going to be fucking very embarrassing to me. There's mm-hmm. always going to be that. Like that's, that guy has a real need, right? And then there's the person who just wants to spend money and have that one-to-one experience, right? So there's always going to be the person who wants personal training. Now, if you do semi-private personal training, one-to-four, that is in my definition, there's always going to be the person who values that experience and wants the coach's eye on them and loves the support and the community and the intra-accountability that the group provides. Like the guy who used to do sport doesn't do it no longer and always worked well when he had other people to kind of pace himself against and shit, you know, that wee bit of help. There's always going to be the person for that. So online coaching does offer a larger opportunity if you're going after the world market, Mm -hmm. but face-to-face coaching will never die. Never. I I, I think, Sean, um, you know, guys are... Uh, you know, I suppose for the people on this call, like you may as well benefit from this. You know, obviously we have had the transition and move online, but I was kind of thinking about this here today as well. Um, why not just like right now look at somewhere that hasn't been overly affected by what's going on and then direct your marketing towards that area? Because, you know, there's going to be people within that area that are still in work. Because right now, as you say, Sean, the world is your market. You know what I'm saying? Like you could direct an ad at fucking uh, somewhere in Zimbabwe where it hasn't been affected massively by what's going on and you could convert people to paying customers. You're exactly right. I mean, look, we've got a, a guy on our, in our coaching group at the minute uh, called Tom Dalton and he runs like corporate coaching. Okay. And he's added three corporate clients to his books and increased his uh, like 20, 30K. And, and this, here's why, because there are companies that are, you know, business is going as normal, yet they're working remotely. Mm. And if they're investing in their people to ensure that they can continue, because tech shit's growing, yeah. tech, tech's still on the up. Yeah. Those people, if they're in a company that values, you know, their... <laughs> fucking listening to a podcast or some shit. If they, if they value productivity, clarity, mental focus and all that shit exercise and nutrition is a key part of the daily structure and those companies still want to provide that mm-hmm. and he's offering it he's like dude and now the first email he was going to write i was like don't send that email tom send this fucking email <laughs> and i was like dude it's not an opt out uh, sorry it's not an opt in oh i'm going to do this would you like and it's like dude this is how we're going to continue to support you through this fucking shit we haven't given you haven't given up on your people we haven't given up on you this is how what we're going to do now he's bringing in some sports psychologists to talk about you know, that end of things, he's bringing in yoga, he's, he's doing, he's uh, pivoting and bringing some other really high perceived value items to the table with these new corporates. But uh, for all intents and purposes, they're getting exactly the same benefit in a changed medium mm. that he was providing before. Yeah. So he's growing his business. Another guy on our, on, on our group, uh, Tristan Hand, has been delivering hybrid personal training. That's what he does. He's 500 quid a month. So that's, that's what I was going to say next. Like, why, why not use this as an opportunity to, to create a new product on the end of it? 100%. Yep, yep. I mean, that, that, that's essentially what we've been doing. Um, we, we were kind of toying with the idea for quite a while. You know, why, why don't we, it's, I suppose, you know, somewhere smack bang in the middle of what Dave, uh, Hugh was actually saying, why not take the best of both worlds? Because people make it a feel for online right now, but they're always going to want those relationships. You know, fitness and relationships are kindness. They're always going to want that. So why not just have the best of both worlds coming out? Why not service the marketplace on both ends? If you're forced now to build the structures and the systems in place that are going to do that, then why not just do it now? As Sean was saying earlier, you know, do stuff that's going to have you come out of the other end of this here in a better position and service both of those people. I, I think you're hundred percent right there. And like, that's kind of getting into what Dave Elwood saying. Like if you listen to what we've talked about in this call here, and we've talked about like actually strategizing, which is what most people do not fucking do, right? They just wing it and they, or they copy the trainer down the road. And then they end up going fucking all different directions. The first thing you need to sit down and map out is like, what does Rome look like? You know, the idea all roads lead to Rome. Mm, okay. That's your happy ticket fucking thing. On your elegant business model, that's where you want most people to end up. They, you want them to ascend to that level. That's why our whole mastermind group's called Ascension. Then it's like, well, what, how can I splice that down to the, there's the done with you, the how, the strategies, the templates, the guides, the execution plans. What do they look like in the ideal business model? 
Because we've all got a chance now to wipe the slate clean and design the kind of business we want to continue in future. Yeah, and then you have the what. And like, if you actually map that out, and then you know exactly where your free content is going to be, you could write, you could fucking do your whole schedule. You know what your products, your first products, the first uh, onto your ascension model, the first level. Do you know what that is? You could start fucking building that, and you could start selling it. Yeah, and dude. what this is, like, if you, just take the time to listen back to the call strategize, actually work out how, it's called setting out your stall. Like every morning we used to get up in the fucking business in the car sales business. And we used to take all the cars from inside the gates and put them out onto the main road front so the mm. people as they're driving by. That's called setting yeah. out your stall to do business. And so, yeah, so good, dude, so good. Um, so, uh, such a good point, Arshon. Yeah, such a good point. I mean, uh, you know, if, if things were, like what were the tiny things that maybe weren't, weren't working as well before this shit happened, right? Because, you, you know, it's either win or learn right now. It's either win or learn. There is no losing in this situation. Like, what were the tiny things that were going wrong before this thing happened? And right now is an opportunity to fix those things. Definitely. Like, if you were to go and open up a, a, another, uh, you know, a, a car sales lot right now, like, how much lessons would you have learned from what happened previously to what happened, am I just like putting ideas in your head right there? <laughs> 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 like if you were to go and open up another car sales, that, like how much lessons would you have learned through the years to be able to go and do that all over again? I always remember you, Sean, asking me, listen, dude, you know, if your business went tits up tomorrow and everything just went completely down the tubes, how long do you think it would take you to rebuild that back up? You remember asking me this, don't you? Yep. How long would it take you to rebuild that back up? And for me personally, I don't think it would take me a very long time. And it's purely because, you know, everyone on here obviously is invested in, you know, their, their time, energy and money and to educate themselves as well. But I always remember Jim Collins saying that it's not the actual success of the business that matters. It's knowing how you can to be successful is what matters because then it's repeatable. Mm -hmm. Then it's repeatable because right now, you know, if every, if the fitness industry goes tits up, what's going to happen at the other end of it is that some people will be left, you know, to their own devices and not know how to get back up there again. Whereas some people who have invested in their time, energy and money will know how to start from point A and go to point B. You know, can you imagine like someone has had it funded for them from day one? Here, I'm going to pay all this here for you. Your point there, I'm going to buy you a gym, I'm going to kit it out, you just go and do it. Now imagine that person is left of their own devices right now, which they will be. What are they going to do to get them back to point B again? Fuck. Well, it's kind of like, I can see in the background there, John, you've got a chessboard, right? I have no fucking clue how to play it. It's an ornament. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, what we've had, I suppose, in the fitness industry at the minute is a lot of people just moving pieces around the board with absolutely no fucking idea what they're doing. So, mm. like, if you've no idea how to play chess, be like, me and you playing chess together, right? But I've got a strategy. I know exactly how the pieces move. And not only that, I have some actual fucking proven strategies that I can follow a formula. Yeah. That, that's the difference in having a system, which is what we have. Look, I've been through this in a fucking second crisis, let's call it, right? Yeah. And, the, the beauty, and I suppose if, if I was to take back, like, what's the one lesson I learned from losing everything? It's like, if you have a system that gives you predictable, repeatable, and profitable results, a marketing and a sales system, you can apply it to any fucking industry. So, so much the, value are, dude. So much fucking value are. So really, like, will personal training explode once this is over? I mean, I don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, but 100%, the need is not going to go away. Hel like you said, health and fitness, and that shit's not going it's to timeless. go away. It's timeless and it's recession proof. People will still move. So like, how long is it going to take you to learn chess? Yeah. How long is it going to take you to get the systems in place so that when it happens, you're ready to fucking go? We, Most we people are we, going to be like, go Sorry, Sean, we have a question from Susan here. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll, un we'll unmute her and let her ask a question. Go ahead, Susan. Oh, sorry. You talked about um, your vision for 18 months. So 18 months down the line, if we're still in this situation, what what do you anticipate um, on how we move forward? Because online coaching is going to get a bit old. Well, in fact, this is something, uh, I'll give you a wee bit of inside information. This is something we actually have in a discussion with our own team about today is the fact that like, you know, 
if you look at what's happening on the Facebook news feed now, you know, what we were doing two weeks ago, it's like, you know, here's homework out. Boom, straight to your phone, on an app, da 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 Fucking everyone's doing that now, right? So you can see as soon as you go in a direction, the market copies you. Now, Dan Kennedy used to call that incestuous marketing, right? And the only thing you get out of the incest is dumb children. That was Dan Kennedy's expression, not mine, right, Susan? Because I know I, I come up with some mad shit, right? But uh, Dan, come up with some mad shit, too. But the thing is, what we've got to do then is when everyone's zigging, we should zag. Mm. So we're going, everybody's getting fucking bored of home workouts now, right? In fact, to the point where they're not consuming them anymore. And this is the key, consumption. So what we're looking at is, well, what are people consuming? What did you just say you had last night? Uh, I had, we had a big Zoom call um, and it was like a fucking, what did we do? Oh, why, a pub quiz? Right, that's what we're doing tomorrow night. We're getting one of the members who does loads of cool pub quizzes to say, we're jumping on, we're having a fucking, a, a quirky quiz. It's going to be a weird thing, right? Bring your own beer. Mm. That's concentrating on the connection. It's totally different from the gym. But when those people have all been on a live Zoom call together, doing something completely different, unrelated to the gym, they're consuming the content again. The connections are revived between every single person in the group. Those kinds of communities and tribal types of shit that goes on, like giving your tribe a way to communicate with visibility and transparency is the key to its growth and its success. So then when we go, right, dudes, like that's the weekend over. It's Monday. Let's get on. It's fucking training time. The likelihood of those people showing up to the people they felt a positive connection with in the past is, is much greater. So we're going to have to think outside of the box here. We're going to have uh, to adjust and adapt. I, I just had something just came to me there and you know, everyone's on here. Like why not combine, why not combine those things? Why not, you know, as a, as like a forfeit, someone has to do, you know, 20 burpees. So, uh, someone has to do so many squats. It's those types. It's that type of interaction, which changes the game. And I suppose, you know, another wee thing, the, the, the actual product, the service itself will never change. So if you, if you look at uh, what Uber do, you know, it, you're still taking someone from point A to point B. It's essentially coaching. What do you do? You take someone from point A to point B, <laughs> but when you change the high, you take them from point A to point B. As Sean says, that's zagging. And that's what Uber done. Yep. And just destroyed a fucking ancient industry. Like, I mean, it, Revolut, you know, AIB just had a discussion because they were like, whoa, we need to close all our stores. Uh, they closed 210 uh, banks in Southern Ireland here just the other day, laid off hundreds of thousands of staff. But they were looking at an excuse to do that for ages, and I know that to be true because some of the people that train with us here are in that field of profession, very, very high up in it. Because Revolut came out and said, what the fuck do you need a branch for? We mm. sent you this really sexy card for free, right? We'll send you this one for free, but if you'd like a real cool black metal one, it's 50 quid. Of course, mm. I bought the 50 quid one. I mean, I'm a sucker for that shit. And now they've just wiped the floor with every bank and they've made it so easy to do banking completely online. You just don't need a branch, which means that all banks are now upside down. They're top heavy in staff. The same thing's happening in the art industry. This is why these people that want to click their fingers and everything to go back to normal. It's like, dude, that ship has sealed. Mm. <laughs> it's gone. Realize that we've got the adapt and adjust to the new market conditions and the people who do that the fastest and act like a professional, no longer amateurs. They've learned the strategy they need, so they're not just moving pawns over the board or copying the guy next to them. They've actually mapped out what their business looks like. They have sanity to check this, and then they are delivering it to the marketplace and tweaking as you go. You've got to, and you've got to be able to react fast to this shit. And again, it's gonna be down to your, like what you're asking me is, Sean, what's the solution? What's the limit to the earning potential of the fitness industry? Your ability to solve problems that exist in the marketplace. Our problem at the minute is everyone's copying us and then consumption of our product drops. And when consumption drops, people don't want to pay anymore. Mm, so we've got to find ways to engage our clients. We've got to find ways to kindle the relationship that we have, keep the lines of communication open. And, and that's going to be the people who succeed out of the other end of this. Love it, dude. Thank you so much, mate. Thank you so much, guys. If we don't have any further questions on here today, um, I'm not going to take any more of Sean's time because he is a busy dude right now. Sean, I don't know about you, dude, but li listen, when we fucking transitioned online, and this is probably why we will eventually charge more for online training, by the way, um, is so much more work involved than actually in person. Like in person, you can just tell someone to do something 
and they go and do it online. There's so much more fucking work on the back end. Like, I don't know. Have you found that? Well, the way we service our online thing, we've done it very smartly. So it takes a five hour investment per week. That's it. Okay. Um, for the, for the true online clients. And it's exactly the same price as the gym. So like to come and train with us, the lowest is 200 euros a month. Mm -hmm. Top end is 300 euros a month. It's the same if you're an online dude. Um, yep. Going forward, transitioning with the clients, we've still got 70% of our members sticking with us. So we had a 30% cancellation rate. And again, those were the kind of customers who maybe were a bit price sensitive, maybe stretching a wee bit, you know, but we were quite smart with the way that we deliver our online coaching so that it didn't because I've seen a lot of people make mistakes and what they realize is, look, again, if you don't have a strategy for delivery, you're just moving pieces around the board and then you end up in a shitty situation. You're in checkmate. You, and what, what, have you, what have you bargained? Your time. So again, this comes back to the strategy and the structures that you need to put in place so that you're not having to live a life around your business, but your business is built around your life. That's the key. Love it, dude. Sean, thank you so much for coming on today, dude. It's always a pleasure. Pleasure, man. I fucking love this. I had a laugh. Did, it, did everybody get good value of this? Massively, Sean. Thank you. Would you have paid for this? <laughs> No, you're fancy. Your fancy is a bit close to the bone. Now, money jumping. Yeah, we. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> well, I'm only messing with your molecules, peeps. Look, thanks. <laughs> thanks for your questions, and thank you, John, for having us on. No pleasure. worries, Sean. Always a pleasure, dude. Thank you so much, mate. Take it smooth and easy. Stay safe. Stay sane, and stay at home. Stay at home. Adios. <laughs> Wash your fucking hands. <laughs>